Uh, my name is John Finn. Uh, I've been documenting a lot of stuff about, uh, so I'm not, not really a, a game writer, uh, but I've been documenting a lot of stuff about games uh, for a while. There was a, um, I was active in the um, in, uh, Usenet groups uh, and uh, documented this model called the Freefold Model, which was later adapted uh, and uh, became popular among Nordic LARPs as well. Um, since then, I've, uh, I've been uh, keeping up an encyclopedia of role-playing games and uh, running the Indie RPG Awards um, and trying to support uh, indie RPG development as well as writing a lot of game theory stuff. John sells himself short. He is a game designer. Just so, so that we're clear on that. I know that's pretty stupid. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jason Morningstar. I'll, I'll own it. I'm a game designer. Uh, and uh, uh, I design for both uh, tabletop role playing games and live action role playing games. Uh, and uh, most of my games drift uh, somewhere in, in, in the continuum between the two. Games, and that's probably fair to say. Um, and I'm interested in hearing from you. I really want to have a dialogue uh, about this. The, the, uh, intersection between these two styles and the, the things that we can learn from each other and uh, ways to, to hack uh, traditional tabletop with LARP components and using the affordances of LARP and tabletop. And uh, you guys all, I'm sure, have really good ideas for ways to do that that we haven't considered yet. I'm Emily Carabas. I started out doing uh, tabletop uh, role playing game design and then got exposed to some really great live action traditions and decided that that was awesome too. So I write the design and publish those. Um, and pretty much I love to steal from every designer and every tradition. So why not have these two different but related forms work together? Can you all hear us? Or, or are we, are we mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to redact my writing them down. I'm going to help you formulate statements, but I don't think that the, the mechanics of that are going to work out uh, too well. But maybe if uh, we have some questions already. No, and some people have written here. Yeah. So we'll we'll take well, take well, um, so I guess my question is maybe a bit of a side detour. I'm curious if you could, so in the last couple of years, people talk about this of the board game renaissance, and board games, a tabletop, I mean, there's always been, it's always been kind of messy. So I wonder if you could comment on what LARP could borrow, or has borrowed in interesting ways from traditional or not so traditional board game design. I can speak to that a little bit. And again, you have to remember that we each have our own contexts and our cultures of play that we've been exposed to. So. In my ignorance, but the things that I'm aware of and that I find really interesting are things like tape barbs, where you're you're using um, you're using physical space and you're marking it out in particular ways, or or uh, barbs where you're controlling the area, for example. Um, Susan Weiner uh, talked about uh, some of that used in, in uh, an academic context in the pre-conference. So there's there's a little bit of that going on. Uh, I think that there are things that can be informed uh, from board games, things about uh, resource economies in particular, it seems like a really fruitful area for certain kinds of kinds of art that you could learn a lot from the very tightly constrained uh, uh, rules and win conditions you find in board games that also have to be communicated with crystal clarity. I would imagine that campaign art might be very closely related to a lot of board game traditions, board games. Um, so, damn it, we don't have an expert for that one. Anybody I'm sure somebody out here yeah. can see. Yeah, um, maybe if anyone has experience to that, you can speak to it. Um, and then they could be too much, but perhaps it is a little bit more concerned. Wargaming experts wanted any in the room? Are you thinking of campaign war games? Yeah, I mean, because to my mind, looking at a buffer or other campaign LARP that is, is very um, combat focused, it would seem like there might be some overlaps between that and um, tabletop war games. Did you want to comment? Um, It's interesting because when you talk about war games, there's the new style of war games where the points are added up and the even out. And yes, they may be unfair for, for whoever bought the latest book and the latest army, but they're generally meant to be balanced games, as opposed to the old war games, which have story elements in them that have 
terrain elements that may reveal surprises where there's actually a second uh, person standing on the side running the war game in addition to the players playing. So it's, um, I don't see the new type of war game relating to uh, LARP in any way except possibly Encourage being, you know, 200 people per side. I don't know. I don't have experience, any experience with that card, but um, definitely the old tradition of war gaming, uh, story of war games, they might relate to uh, LARP, but it's so tenuous that it's. That's fine. Let's move on. Yeah. I've got some other examples. So. Uh, that's great. That's a great right, example. Maybe I'll uh, did you have another uh, oh, comment yeah. on this particular? Uh, sure. Uh, the, uh, sorry, I think, um, so uh, the example that comes to mind for me is Starship Valkyrie, um, which is run in, uh, in Southern California, where which is very much a, a hybrid of, of board game uh, and LARP. So uh, for those who don't know about it, there's um, you know 30 to, to 50 people who are, who are um, playing. And 20 to 50 people, so uh, who are playing the crew of a starship, um, and there are board game elements uh, of, of all of it. There's the bridge crew who are all dealing with one board game. Uh, there's the, the fighter pilots um, who are dealing with another board game, and then a lot of other people are are, are much or more larpy moving around the uh, moving around the ship. Um, and uh, probably there, there may, there's probably something similar with the. With no, the, I think this is an entire tradition by yeah. now, almost yes. that that model, because like the Monitor Celestra had yes. very much the same thing. We spoke yeah. board game systems for different crews, only they were digitized. Some of them, where some of them used like proper day, dead reckoning, the, yeah, skill navigation, it's math navigation. But definitely there's. And the, there's a number of games that I've run, or people around me have run, that have like a hardcore board game system in the middle, and then loads of like a, a very dramatic, very physical uh, LARP around it. And the yes. perfect form for that is the spaceship LARP. So I think that is like, it is a living board game. Yes. And there's like so many examples. Now coming up now is the board ship Concordia, which is heavily inspired by 40K, which I think pulls this one step even further, because the guy designing that, he is a board game designer at his core, and he has the, the goal of making, a lot of them haven't been that well balanced, Montos Lester certainly wasn't, uh, but he, he's aiming for a like well balanced board game system that encourages play, and where the results of the moves within the, the board game gives active uh, reason for, for conflict and interaction. So I think it's a perfect, perfect example where this lives. About recent recent board games, as I certainly the the German the Euro game tradition um, pays a lot more attention to the, than many previous games about player involvement. So because what would happen in many earlier board games, which is an, an issue also in LARPs, is um, players would get killed early or would get sidelined early because of the way that the the, the rules or, or the, the scenario was set up, um, and to look at that as um, from a more mathematical mathematical modeling perspective of how do we keep all the players involved um, and within the uh, within the space, um, which is something that Euro games do very well. Do you have a I, 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 on the subject of, of, of Starship LARPs, because Jose's question was specifically about newer board game design, uh, which is which is iterating off the Euro game, but also on, on story and party games as well. And, and, and I, I think the um, the ship LARPs I've played at usually are about 10 or 15 years behind yeah. in, or, 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 or playing Battleship. Yeah. And, and so it, that's actually a frontier for us to design on, is to really take a board game from like, you know, to take Mysterium, for example, and to try to iterate on that. Or something like, you know, we, we can actually push on on those frontiers a little bit further rather than taking an older board game. Accepting the fact that Battleship allows us to role play other things, right? The, the uh, Inside Hamlet, uh, war game in the middle That's allowed right. us to role play, right? Because if we didn't have to think about, oh well, how many points do, do I have? But 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 it would be so cool to see integration with new order again. Yeah, I'd like to uh, tie that into uh, this, the board game element to Jason's talk about the talking thinking about what what LARPs do well, what role playing games do now. We're kind of introducing a third element that we, that 
that didn't come up last night is what's the core of uh, board games that they do well is the same from those two. And maybe that gives Emily and John a chance to give uh, your definitions of, of the, of the larger RPG cores as well. Uh, and Jason, you can kind of take your hand on that too. <coughs> Any of you have thoughts on that? So uh, yeah, uh, Jason said we've got we've got this this molten core uh, that's, that's shared between Lark and Tabletop, but there's distinctions of things that each of them do well and things that, that each of them uh, uh, kind of gaps in, in the system. And where do where do board games fall in that? What's the, what's the core of, of board games and what's what's shared between those? So kind of instead of the dichotomy, kind of maybe looking at a, a three way model of that. Yeah. Uh, as far as board games, uh, uh, as far as board games go, uh, I think so. It's it's much more. It's a much more formal system, uh, obviously. So you're um, you're you're channeling uh, players uh, uh, players involvement, but uh, you're still um, you're still engaging players in uh, in stuff that's happening. They're 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 invested. They care about uh, about that stuff, and that's. Um, there, there's some people. Sometimes people have draw more of a difference between like story and, and game than uh, than I think is always is always the case. Because people, you know, people come. Uh, game is a way for get to get people to care about um, things that are that are in the fiction. Something that seems to be a strength of board games and card games to me is carrying a lot of information in a very compact way. Um, I, I use um, a card game as a component of a, a, a free from larks that I'm working on um, about uh, English history and poetry about Paradise Lost. And the, is anybody familiar with the card game timeline? I, I love the game. I'm it's fun. Uh, very Eurocentric. Maybe they'll revise it someday. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but it, it's a really good and fun and easy way to teach people or to learn history. And I like using it collaboratively. So at the beginning of this game, you sit down with uh, John Milton, the life and times of John Milton in the form of timeline. And uh, the players uh, get to play this. And mostly they're actually just playing cards that give you a little bit of trivia about John Milton and his life and, you know, like the political situation, the uh, religious factions and stuff. And then every so often, they actually have to guess where to place something. It's just enough. It just keeps them engaged. They're not just like listening to me going on and on about English history. They're doing it, and then there's something that they're guessing. And when someone gets it right about placing when John Linton died or when he lost his sight, whatever it is, everyone cheers. So there's this nice reinforcement, a nice feeling of play about learning. Um, and I've gotten good feedback about that, that component. And, my fellow GM who ran the game is not in so, um, so that was uh, critical. Couldn't even freaking think about running that game without something that would ground people in the history, and that worked really well, very concisely. I didn't say what the molten car was, I cheated. That's okay. Can I ask a new question? Is that sure, yeah. Let's, let's, well, can I have one more? Uh, yeah, John, and then we just kind of, there, there's one thing missing about the, but board, so about the newer board games um, is the rise of, of cooperative board games like Pandemic, um, uh, shared and so forth, and that's um, and changing the game model of LARPs, so the, the of of game game like LARPs um, to be to to use that cooperative element is something I'd love to see explored more. Can you run it characteristic? Uh, let's let's uh, let's look. Let's hear what James. Yeah, we'll, we, I think we'll come back around right too. <laughs> That's it. All right. So one of the biggest challenges that I've run into with putting tabletop techniques to life is that it is the camera difference. Right in tabletop, there's like one theater that everything happens in, so anything that happens, everyone sees and can respond to that. But in the majority of LARPs, um, that's not the case unless you're doing a very theatrical LARP. So I was wondering if you guys could speak to recommend design recommendations for porting indie style tabletop design techniques to multi camera, like nobody has, like LARP on the board situations. Like the fog of LARP, right? Fog so of LARP. Things, are, you know, things are distributed, they're synchronous, but uh, distributed, which is problematic from a tabletop point of view. Uh, uh, actually, Pretty easy from a tabletop point of view, or, or the other way around. It's very difficult mm -hmm. for, for tabletop to handle that. Mm -hmm. 
you know, because you have imperfect knowledge. And somehow that works in LARP, and I've never understood exactly why. <laughs> but it totally does. It's magic. It is magic. <laughs> oh. So, uh, so, how do you, so your question is, what are some things that the tabletop does well that you can? That you that survive the port to fog of life. I'm especially sure. curious about handling of time breaks, if it's possible, like non continuous time, but really just like any techniques that you recommend to go with that technology. Sure. Do you have thoughts on this? Um, freeform LARP and Nordic LARP, I, I have always felt like steals ruthlessly from tabletop and just takes the assumptions that you use in that and puts it into LARP. Um, things like the physical focus that um, let's go of the fog of LARP uh, idea. That's not answering your question, but that's been the fix that has always worked really well for me. And I, I love it. We're sitting here, you and I have like sort of di diametrically opposed um, uh, design philosophies in some ways because you really embrace the continuous play uh, style, and I have really embraced the break it up uh, meta techniques, um, see what I see. At least that's how I see it. So I don't see it. I don't necessarily see that way. Jason. He's right. That's okay. Um, uh, so anyway, that, that's how I've handled the fog of LARP is fuck it. I do not like it. Um, and that's not, that's obviously not the only way to handle it. Um, uh, what comes to mind is a, a nice evening with a family, which was written by uh, Anna Vestale. Uh, which was a really groundbreaking uh, early early black box, and uh, there are many people here who will correct me on the details of everything. Um, but um, but what she did was she took six different plays of uh, memory books, uh, seven, seven. Uh, that's right. Can't forget Toe Jensen uh, and Moon, um, and uh, mashed them all up so that people were workshopping and learning about being characters from these plays, and then they all came together and had. Evening with the family, which was every fucking horrible dysfunction you can imagine that's embodied in these plays. Um, and every so often, there would be, um, uh, there was an area parked out um, so that you could do uh, a um, sort of a spotlight scene that, that broke out of the, the general flow, which most of it was. Um, was anyone who went at that? that? We have two people, three. Uh, any thoughts about how that worked out or how that, 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 that changed the dynamic? Um, I mean, first, let's say, uh, I'd like to think about LARP as a subset of performance and a subset of theater, not as a subset of game, necessarily. Um, I think it's useful to attach ourselves to that, and this was the game that made that leap the easiest, because it was in the dramatic tradition and the performance tradition. Mm -hmm. So instead of creating characters, you, uh, you do readings from the plays until you have a character. And that's very much a dramatic and performance way of approaching it rather than anything else. So I think it's like, it moves away from this discussion and says like, what can we learn from performance? A lot of it was that. But the directors that they had, which are these black clad, abstract uh, game mastery figures and so on, it's hard to think about them as mechanics because they are so based in performance rather than game design. Uh, so that's like shooting in the third thing here, which I think, I hope that next year we'll have like, what can we learn from 60s performance theory, like sure. Richard Schechner and so on. Let's have that panel, because that's really highly relevant to this game. Yeah. But yeah, so but yes, super good game. <laughs> Unlike Martin, I was a hard-ass LARPer when I came to that, and uh, one of the things I think I took with me ten years after it looked really good. When I was there, I thought, what the fuck. I mean, <laughs> this is a lot. People in black clothing running around, what, what's going on? And somebody stands up on a box and they're doing an inner monologue. And of course, if you haven't trained with that sort of thing, you're just thinking, why is everybody quiet? And why is he saying stuff about being unfaithful to us? Oh, yeah, there's the technique thing. It, it, for me, as, as coming from a strong LARP tradition, it, it really did. The black box stuff worked fine, but, but putting the meta techniques into the LARP worked less well, not because they were bad, they were extremely good, but because there was very little effort spent in, in sitting down with people and explaining to them why this was cool. I mean, my small group, we divided into small groups which had these directors, and ours was a guy who came from theater. This was his first LARP project. He ended up storming off in anger at some point because we didn't want to do it his way. We, we clearly knew what we wanted out of the time <laughs> with our group, and at some point he was just like, I cannot, if you guys don't follow me, so just leave, we can manage without you. Um, 
Yeah. Performance. Love. love has come later, but but so I think the tip was if you're going to port stuff, make it very clear to the people who are not used to it that this may seem outrageous and outlandish and stupid to you. Please give it a chance, and if you don't give it a chance, shut up about it because other people will enjoy it. Uh, I just like to correct a little bit the, the, the description of how that was structured. So it was very much of what you see is what you get 360R. Yeah. Yeah. That is four, and it went on for, there was a workshop, I think. So it was a very long evening. I think we started with, with cocktails arriving at the house. Or something. And then we played until after midnight when all the suicides from all these different days had happened. Um, and <laughs> the, framework, the framework was uh, Thomas Hinderberg's The Celebration, if you know that film, which is a 60th birthday party where somebody stands up and gives a speech to their father about how he has sexually abused them in childhood. So that's like the baseline of emotion there. But, but they did have, so there was, like, like Paul said, there was some of these, these better techniques introduced in the game, like monologue boxes, and there were some areas where you could speak your, the inner truths of your character in the game flow, but they were um, geographically sort of separated. Um, there was a separate black box off, off the main space where you could go and, and play uh, flashbacks and flash forwards. Um, but I would say that, that the vet techniques didn't, weren't very well integrated into the, into the play, uh, into the, the flow of the game, and therefore I think people didn't actually use them very much. So, so that, that was an example of a game that didn't actually resolve the problems mm. that it introduced. But one thing they did that was very cool was that at one point they broke the play to something they called the meta hour. Mm. And the, the player groups, uh, all the characters from all the separate plays, uh, if you were in like the dollhouse, you went into the dollhouse room and everybody, and then everybody spent one hour negotiating and reconnecting. And, and so they were taking to sort of break through the photo mark. Like, okay, what have you been doing? Like, where are we in the plot? Are we moving on? Like, are we hitting the mark that we have to do? Because the, the main goal, of course, was what we had to follow what was going to happen in the place. And uh, so that was the way where they just said, well, we're going to break around time, and we're going to do this separate thing, brief everybody about what's going on, and then move on. And that's one way, I guess, of, of solving that problem. Yeah. And that works super well. Yeah, yes. that, yeah just having that like, directorial rounds, this is almost, this has become a common technique. We used it in Hamlet as well, and it was used in Just Let the Love Ring. And so there's like everybody standing in a circle and saying, what would you like to happen in the next act? Right, yeah. It's like, that is a way of destroying the fog of Lark in an efficient way. So, yeah, some practical suggestions about that. Find some diegetic reason to have everybody... Not, not necessarily diegetic. This is like, oh, right. there are different right. acts. Right. It's like a sure. act break, and you ask actors, you stand there and say, you're directing each other in a circle and say, like, I would like to be, if you have, like, the next, I would like to be terribly abused in the next act, because that would be perfect for me. <laughs> and then everybody just makes requests, nobody needs to answer. And that really, really worked. Or say, like, you have to realize that I have now gone blind. My character has gone blind. That's like important information for everybody to reset for the next act so it doesn't get lost in the 360 wild illusion mist of everything. That's useful. I have another tabletop oriented example. Uh, did you have one? Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, it is Jay Lee plus Evan Dur uh, Turner. Um, Parlor Sandbox Lab. Uh, is a is a mod that a mode that's been developed um, by Evan and, and Ketchens, Um that really just takes a lot of uh, it's like you're suddenly playing a lark <coughs> on a monopoly board yeah, in a good way um, and with interactive elements and of course that's a, a terrible mis uh, characterization but it's, it's a little bit oh I mean people people compare it with a ski lift right where you just kind of get on to the plot line and then like go along with that and then when you want to just jump off you jump off and and I think it, it, in, in some ways um, one of it, the way that we solve the time problem is the same way that the Russians have which is that continuous time is just not a thing if, if you are standing near somebody in, in that location you are in the same time as them who the fuck cares that there's some other universal time that, that it's, 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 it's kind of like the space-time continuum right you anyway wait when, when larpers approach you you actually approach them in time and, and, and that it, larp relativity. It, larp relativity. Yeah, that's where that, there we are. So so in, in that respect, and the Russians have been doing this for years, where, where you know if you have a, a hundred person or three hundred or five hundred person larp, the the, the, the fog of larp is too much. So you, it, it's much easier to be like, oh, you know, Sir, Sir Elric, you're here, you are. 
uh, exactly on time, as expected. Um, and the other key parts of, of the form that I really appreciate that feel like tabletop are um, physical elements. Uh, like you'll, you'll have locations, which you often do in a lark. Maybe there, there's some elephant represented. There's a sign on the wall that says it's the pit of despair. It's just the corner of the wall, the room, but it's the pit of despair in your mind. Um, so in uh, Parlor Sandbox Lark, there'll be a folder that has a sheet of paper and has a description of the pit of despair. Um, it's a deep, dark pit. It's jagged around the edges. Um, there are some birds calling. Um, so that's what you come to. And you can go there and you can write a little, and people are encouraged to write about their experiences in the place. So I can go there and say, I went there and I cried. And there are some, you know, there, there's some wet spot there and, and a hanky that's been dropped. And then someone else comes along later and murdered their brother. So then they write, there's a dead body here with a knife sticking out of it. And then, so then the next people that come to the location, um, they'll probably ignore my handkerchief, but they'll pay attention to the bed, dead body with a knife in it. They'll take, you know, they'll loot it or whatever. Um, <laughs> um, and it's wonderful watching this in action. We, there's one that, that Evan wrote based on um, my husband's game, City, um, Swords Without Master, that was set in a place called the City of Byron Quinn. And we created in this some um, caged tigers. And, oh man, I'm just waiting, waiting for that to happen, that they were going to free those tigers. Because obviously, you see, it, they're, you're LARPers who want to, want to, um, uh, change inequities, and if you see um, uh, uh, poorly handled tigers that are caged in the middle of the city, you're going to let them free eventually, and it happens. It was wonderful. And it's 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 horrendous. It, it's de depending on two things. They're actually having a lot of freaking GMs. Like uh, your your typical GM ratio is optimal about uh, three to one or four to one. Oof. Yeah, 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 and we call them counter players, right? Uh, it, 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 when we ran Bloodnet, the cyberpunk vampire lark, we had 11 players and five GMs, and some of whom were the top in the tabletop designers. <laughs> so it was a little unfair, but at the same time, it would be, you, you give them almost no direction. You say, here, you, you, you're in charge of monsters, so and otherwise, if, 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 anything that people encounter, you, you encounter, but then, then, then the other, the other aspect of that, which is very important, is that the GMs have to check in with each other. The counter players have to figure out, and, and so if there's a dead body lying, lying on the ground, then at some point they have to get stop running a scene and run over to the other GM, being like, "Okay, here's the dead body," and we would love a way to streamline that information. That's our current. Problem. But there's only five people who need to put their heads together and communicate and stay current. Yeah. I, I see the GMs functioning as notes of information, but everything comes back through them. And not everything does, and not everything needs to come back exactly. through them. And that's why the game functions. If it needed to all come back through those GMs, it wouldn't work. But the players, it's democratized. The players are changing the game world. You know, it's like VR without the V. But, 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 giant rats and then by the fourth hour they're fighting God. It may be because that's that how do you escalate and so, so you can't do you can't do a campaign mark this one. Oh uh, yeah I think that we, we can maybe um, we've been talking a lot about uh, one of the things that I've been hearing a lot about is uh, information management. Yes you're talking to and uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, tabletop type information management as you talk about board game the information density bringing that into LARP space, but maybe we can shift gears and flip that on its head. Uh, what about that LARP information management fog of LARP uh, can, can be brought into more table topic situations? So we've got to look the other way on information management techniques. If any of you have thoughts on that. Because uh, it's been done for a long time, the idea of uh, fog of war, you know, literally is a thing in tabletop where you know the, the old school way to play tactics too is to have a referee and a screen between the two sides of the board. Um, so, so that's something that that's a, that's essentially a solved problem if you want to sort of get right down to it. If you want to play two two games of Cyberpunk 2020 in two different houses and have two GMs that communicate with cell phones. Then you can do that. Um, so the play is distributed, and that's not really a problem. Now, what about uh, this like 
mark relativity that we're talking about. The, the, there's something that's that seems like uh, the markers are that's a, sort of a desirable experience. There's a, you said there's a magic to that of, of the time because you're talking about two two table things that are separated with with uh, clear information control and, and timeline synchronization between them. What about a uh, playing with uh, kind of non non synchronous time streams? And have examples of that, or uh, it, it, I mean, it's what's your thoughts? Um, yeah, well, um, in the in my Diso circles, so the Amber uh, Amber Diso is a mechan uh, low mechanics uh, game. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of playing with tons of secret play where people go off and do things, and then they go off, and then some of the players go off into another reality where they spend a century. Um, in the same time as, as some other people are uh, um, are taking just a couple days um, or a couple minutes because they're in some intense combat, um, and it's uh, I, I don't have any great. I mean, there's there's communication that, that happens, and it's it's a, a bunch of small techniques about managing, um, and like there'll be a, a, we've had a couple games where there was a pair of GMs who would take. Different groups of players off, and then they, um, and then they just have signaling methods of getting players back onto the same time scale when they want to meet again. Do you think that there's? It seems like there's probably stuff to be learned from secrets and power slarps related to that, um, which I'm not an expert at. I don't know anything about actually. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm actually pretty, pretty familiar with secrets and powers. It's popular in. West Coast, but I uh, uh, don't immediately see the pullover from Secrets and Powers to to have stuff because they, they each have their own strong traditions of, about how to how to do those things. I'm not sure whether this really falls really under LARP or really under tabletop. It's really in between. But mega games are something that is seeing a little bit of uh, popularity right now. Uh, has anybody played some or run them? What is a mega game? I will describe it. Um, it is uh, let's see. a mega game, as I have experienced it. I think if there's a little bit of diversity, um, it is a, a large scale. Um, uh, it's a scenario that's sort of like a, a model G, model UN, but it has sub systems within it. So the the game that I participated in, it was an alien invasion scenario. Um, humanity didn't know it, but aliens had landed on Earth. 20 years ago or something, and so the scenario that we ran through was a crisis point where the aliens were starting to have active negative effects on political and uh, military uh, uh, installations all around the world, and so there were different teams of players that were from each country. Um, each team had you know, a, a person who was a delegate to the UN, the head of the country, the head of the military, a um, couple of other positions, and each of them was associated with a sub-game. So the beginning of the day, you convened and heard the briefing, and then everyone would go off in turns and play their little sub-game. So there was this massive uh, map of the whole world. And so some people were pushing chits around and rolling dice and having a war game. And then there were people who were at the UN, and they were negotiating, trying to get treaties done, and there were secrets, and um, it had a massive problem with information flow. Were you 100 players? This was only 40 yeah, players. Yeah. Thank God. <laughs> Did, do you have a question about that particularly? Or so you asked if, if we played them around them, I don't know. And the gentleman behind you. No, my question was, what was that? Did you ask? Oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> yes, it's okay. um, So it, it's a really, really awesome form. When I was young, one of the really uh, formative game experiences I had was uh, hosted by the Buckminster Fuller Institute, the World Game, which was amazing. And it was a real hands-on educational simulation that the map was the um, Buckminster Fuller, who is a very influential scientist, engineer, thinker, um, created a, a certain projection of map of the world that had the least distortion on land. The distortion was all put off onto the seas. Stupid seas, who needs them? <laughs> um, but it was really interesting because it allowed us to actually look at the world, because most of our projections, you know, Greenland, Swedish, whatever it is. So we stood on this map that covered the whole of a, a basketball you know, a court inside a school. And each of us was uh, a percentage of the population of the world. And we were in our countries. And then we were given the problems of the world. And we had to solve them. 
It didn't happen, but it was very <laughs> uh, You know, I had that t-shirt, I wore it for like 20 years because it really meant a lot to me. So it's neat to see this coming back in a different way. This mini game that I was playing is much more recreational. It was you know, coasting along the issues, the serious issues of the world, but it wasn't trying to do that. But that certainly, you know, that possibility is there, and it was very accessible. There were a lot of people there who would play board games, they would play Carcassonne settlers or something like that. So they thought of this as, oh, it's a, it's a board game that I'm going to be in. Um, and the people who were at the UN were amazing. I got to moderate them. And it was like wonderful, these great debates, unknowns. So they just did their thing. And after a while, they declared that they were the best in the world and screw everybody else. Um, but it was, it, was a, it was a failure of mechanics there. But um, uh, and at the various panels, I've talked about how, uh, how amazed I am at the work that LARP writers put into their games, which get played once. Holy Christ, the work that these developers did on uh, this game is crazy, so I hope they'll continue and get it going. But um, it's literally right in the, the juxtaposition between live action and board games, because you're doing that and you're, you're LARPing. And I think it, it sort of was failing because those elements weren't merging properly. But they didn't have an excellent board game in the middle that really informed everything, like Monitor Celestia. Sounds like it was an amazing uh, instantiation of that. Yeah. Uh, maybe it, not. It could, it, yeah, it's still being iterated upon. Board Chip and Coin is an iteration, it's another really iteration. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's in the physicality, that's not in the board game design. I can question the board game design, not the beauty of the ship. Fair enough, fair enough. Anyway, I think this is a great model. Um, and it's a little bit in crisis because it's really hard to put together. Um, but it's a very, very accessible model that, like, as we think about our audiences being beyond just people who are you know, gamer or identified, it, it's really accessible. Um, and um, so I hope that there's more development of that. Jason, one of the things that we talked about in the email thread before is that the demographics of uh, uh, large reaching different demographics that people have, and it strikes me that these uh, hybrid, I think we're using hybrid in two different ways that are really distinguishing. Games that are kind of tabletopy, kind of yeah, sorry. Uh, there's games that are kind of tabletopy, kind of LARPy that we've talked about, and then there's the ones that uh, have a very, a fairly distinctive board game element, a fairly distinctive LARP component, and communicating between those. And uh, it strikes me that that, that may um, speak to the, the demographic issue of you're creating a game that, uh, without uh, making the, if there is a tabletop game demographic, making them play LARP and making LARP people play tabletop, but Bringing those two demographics together in, in one large game seems like maybe one way to uh, to think about the, those demographics, um, and I guess I'll use that as a lead-in to say, uh, are there demographic demographic differences between tabletop and modern? What do you guys think? I would hasten to say we have little data, right? Especially on the on the uh, board and tabletop side, the, we have the large census now, which gives us some rough idea of the shape of, of that community. Um, and I think that it's, uh, people are still pouring over that, so I'm trying to understand that data. But, but um, so, so talking about demographics is actual numbers. I don't know that we can do very well. Um, but in terms of like interest groups or, or enthusiasts, there certainly there certainly are distinctive characteristics. And one of the things that I think that I've benefited from and enjoyed is that I have uh, some credibility as a tabletop role playing game designer. Uh, so people. Or I seem to be willing to give me the benefit of the doubt, uh, which means that uh, when I when I introduced a uh, uh, a game that's essentially a, a hybrid tabletop uh, LARP kind of game into the retail space and asked people to pay eight dollars for it, they were willing to do that and then to try it with their friends because they trusted that uh, that the quality of my work was going to be good and that they were willing to take a risk on something that maybe was new and unfamiliar to them. And I think that's a um, it's a good model, and I hope to see other people kind of do that as well. Sort of stealthily uh, get people hooked on a different model of play, and that could easily go both ways. But in my case, it's gone all from tabletop to LARP. I'm sort of making new LARPers, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and this is all on a very small scale with with uh, with really small, intimate games. So if you were going to play, uh, you know, a, a game of Pathfinder with your five friends on the weekend, you can easily do the same thing. With the same five people in the same amount of time, but suddenly it's a, it's a LARP, right? right. And, and the, they're self-contained. So for a group that wants to continue, they what they really want to do is play a campaign tabletop game, but 
you, it allows them for just this one event to like, okay, well, this week we'll try Fiasco. Sure, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Or, yeah, or some right. kind of large experience. Yeah, right. yeah um, I think one obvious thing that we haven't mentioned is like the first time that a tabletop role playing game really put live action role playing in the first chapters. And that is, of course, Vampire the Masquerade, first edition, mm -hmm. which has a large chapter, 91. The introductionary scenario is a mini LARP, it's a small chamber RP thing. And of course, there you, there, to me, it like, has to have been an, there should be some kind of development in the mix between LARP and tabletop in the mind side theater space, because that to me is essentially a blend of live action role playing and tabletop with, you know, storytellers, system derived and compatible from a popular tabletop game, uh, community that uses the same background rules, that buys the same products, and so on. Uh, of course, I think that game has created an inflow of LARPers, or it's just created a whole massive genre of LARPing. So what has the sort of the theoretical work on the vampire scene, or the mindset theater scene been? Is there any? Have they just like stuck in time? or Because I don't know the American scene at all. Very I think that's a really excellent question. Yeah, I, would have asked you. Huh? I would have asked you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's like I'm, I come from a European perspective, and when I come into this, like having this treasure, it's like, okay, what do we do with it? How do we make this relevant now? What has happened to the community? What is their, their own natural experiments in this player versus player, moderated by game masters, which can be mega games. I mean, the, the, the Grand Masquerade games that I played are certainly similar to mega games and so on. What's the position of that? I know we've got, uh, here, here, and then I just saw some movements in the front. Yeah, I've got a first entry, it comes from uh, two different directions. One, um, the, the one camera style that came out of Gen Con, you can't do LARP here, but they were to do LARP anyway, um, is essentially, you have characters, you have events, one scene at a time, you play out a scene as if there's one camera. So everyone is seeing every scene. Um, but not everyone's in every scene, right? So you, you just can play the story on camera at a shot at a time. Um, that's been applied to vampire tabletop games, which you're standing up, you're moving around, you're interacting with the bigger market, right? Or, or a hybrid form. Um, that happened very quickly in people that were familiar with that already because it was such a natural transition point. Often using the vampire work, the, the metal production early work rules uh, initially and, and continuing. Um, in scene-based games. Uh, going the other direction, I think I think there is some and could be more, a lot more drawn in from uh, really experiential moments that uh, I would now call uh, derived from or, or influenced by black box. Um, but we're happening before I knew anything about black box. Or I mean, but they, they led into black box, but they're coming out of black box um, now. I, I think that that vampire is like the birth of a vampire, especially a Sabat, right, coming out of the ground. Uh, that was played out in a vampire campaign um, in the 90s um, to great effect. In Black Box in Black Box before, before Black Box right, even right, existed. Exactly, yeah. right. But, I mean, of course, right, all this stuff has race. Um, I, I think since the 90s, I know of no innovations. And in fact, I think of regressions. Yeah. Um, because people have, not, and that's, that often happens, there, there's been a still defining of, uh, people People have dug into the kind of vampire play they want and have, have calcified that a little bit. So it's like the struggle for the prince, you win or die, yeah, yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. power yeah. games. Yeah. So let's accept that as a form of play that's legitimate, and then take a hammer to that as the only form of play. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Jay has a comment, and, and I want to have an introduction, but you can Table. Uh, so the, the other community. So um, uh, Legend of the Five Rings uh, and yeah. Call of Cthulhu both have uh, yeah. both have LARP communities that are, are fairly uh, not, not as big as uh, as Vampire, but they've they've done some expansion um, and they've uh, um, uh, you know they have have some uh, have some development, but they're, uh, as far as I've seen, they, they're um, there's not a uh, there's not a strong like. Uh, individual game masters have their own innovations uh, about how to uh, about how to develop this out, um, but they're not they're not coming together. It's almost like the Call of Cthulhu scene has 
bespoke mechanics for every single event, whereas the mindset theory still has this like, framework. Almost all of them aren't the same. That's my impression from the outside. Um, They're very more more similar than the the uh, like love craft historical society and like other yeah. different groups. Yeah, yeah I, yes, yeah. that's uh, that's true. Yeah. Jason, you have. My quick comment was, I think we're seeing some uh, massive change right now, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. yes. Do you have a comment? Oh, uh, just, uh, so having played a lot of Empire to the Pop as well as my, uh, I found that it's in the self really well to the format we used that we call walking table pop, which might be kind of similar to the last box. Tell us about that, I've never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, well, so it's like, we use multiple formats, but it's you play table pop and you do it in a room with multiple breakout rooms, and then you know you narrate and you narrate and you break out to these scenes. Because Vampire is a game in which social interaction and performative interaction, like you know, breaking out of the ground or whatever, is so important. Um, and the majority of that can be what I want, right? But then I feel like Vampire Lark really suffers from the fact that it, you don't get to encapsulate a lot of action, and the action doesn't happen well in our formats, so and then you just go back to the top, and then they're not going to relax and go in and out. That's very, that sounds very similar to this, the Danish semi but not the concept. Yeah. So which is basically that, going back and forth fluidly. I think, I love that form. It, it's great, and people are resistant to it, but they have more strengths. Yeah. 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 Mine's a whole other subject, so if you're commenting on this again. No, I was going to complete it. All right. Whole other subject. Uh, keep in mind something that actually Jose was talking about the other day. I'm thinking about blurring the lines between tabletop, LARP, board games, even further by turning computers in, uh, by which I don't mean what we normally think of a, a computer as an immersive tool. I mean it as a, as a mediating tool. For example, if you consider bomb disposal, it is basically a whole bunch of people dealing with a fourth dimensional board game, uh, or Artemisia, which is effectively not that dissimilar from Amp Card when you get down to it. You have someone who's captain, someone who's doing sensors, someone who's doing whatever. Uh, view screen, which incorporates tabletop elements uh, in terms of cards, a, a large element, and the, the computer is centered to it. If you need me to describe it further, I will. I'm trying to go faster, everyone is tired. Uh, or even the client, which, because of the MP3, for me, often the, the, the fact that it is a sensory environment is often created by a computer that, that creates an uh, immersive space without necessarily being visually mimetically immersive uh, are very, very valuable traits. But I feel like uh, often the, the, the obsession with 360 immersion eclipses the ways that, that the computer can offer itself as a, as a tool here. Um, I have no idea how to design for that. I'm curious if, if other people have thought about it or dealt with it in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Uh, I think most of us game designers are like, holy crap, I should have apps in my game. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jason, have you done that already? We're working on it. There, there is, there are like, there's a fiasco app, the fiasco computer. But uh, but uh, the, the example of the climate I think is a good one because the the, uh, the the piece of the game you're talking about is just a 90 minute long MP3 of howling wind with with situational prompts embedded in it, um, which is a really quick and dirty way to remove the game master from the game and provide you with everything you need to run it uh, independently. Of outside influences, um, so that was that was absolutely me looking at the situation that I had created and saying, how do I control for this? Um, and and I wanted it to be as 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 easy for someone to instantiate as possible. And audio is not particularly difficult, uh, so it became a 90 minute long MP3, um, and that's that that works for that that instance. And uh, it seems like a, a pretty effective use of technology. Uh, and I, I would agree with you. I, I'm very much on board with the idea that 360 immersion can be an impediment, and, and that uh, hiding under uh, dining tables with, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, drapes over them to pretend to be tents can be uh, just as effective as actually going to the Canadian Arctic and freezing your ass off. No. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs>
for Mindset like Theater, for instance, should we do them? I, I feel like the focus on apps is the opposite of what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, oh, because, because what I'm talking about is just using the computer as a, as a mediating object, which is brutally simple, but effective. Um, like, Artemisia is not a game that fools you into believing that you're actually in space, but it's effective for that. Um, Ustream, you're, you're playing on Google Hangouts, but it's effective because you can turn the camera off and on. That is super basic technology that enables people to play from all over the world. Uh, so I, I think a focus on apps is a push towards technological, technological complexity that in some ways inhibits the, the potential of the media. Um, because it requires, uh, Matt was saying earlier, often requires an expert. Yeah. Screw experts. <laughs> do something that does not require an expert. You can do a lot. So what I'm hearing so, you say, is that we we know that dice are this thing that you can do. Like, we know like all these tricks that you can do without, you don't have to do anything, you just know how dice work. And you're saying that computers are objects that are out, are out there. We already know how to turn on and off the camera, what are ways that you can yeah. um, use the, the tricks that exist. Yeah. I just, I'm sorry, Artemis is the, the multi-computer spaceship. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, like I just, I mean, I'm sure this is emerging everywhere, but I certainly know a, a Danish crew of guys who've been running Artemis at conventions in Star Trek uniforms for quite some time, and now they just took the step and go to the venue and built, um, um, <laughs> what, what's it called, the bridge, uh, where they run LARP. Where, where they run spaceship LARPs based on the same technology, because they've been so close to it for so long, and now they're just like, well, it's a product. I think their core audience are gamers, but of course, also team building and that kind of, uh, kind of thing. And I don't know if it's Star Trek specific, but of course it allows to be a thing for all of us. I kind of wish that we had taken Artemis reskin for more per semester because that shit is tested and it works. Instead, we did a custom system with you know, Arduino switchboard yeah, to look exactly like it. You just can't, because it's got intentional randomness, you can't point on the. Yeah. No, you, can, you can't link it to an Arduino in that way. As yeah. another sort of Verizon example, Samara Haley Steele in the lab showcase talked about a project she's working on, which is a, an interface that would um, connect ecological scientists with game and LARP runners to allow the like, game and LARP runners to have like kind of grind activities that they might want to have um, the players from game points to move forward, dictated by the ecological restoration scientists. I should be doing these activities that are like collecting something or reading or, or doing a toy that has some in-game fictional uh, uh, weight that is actually having real-world effect. So that's, that's cool. We have a photo here. So this is um, a little broader question about the same topic. I think, to me, one thing is really important about like uh, any game is that you get you advertise it well and you you get you set player expectations correctly and you get the right players to self-select into a game they actually want to be in. And if we're going to combine methods from like, or elements from board games, tabletop games, and LARPs, we're kind of talking, that's the three different things that different people like, and not everybody likes all three. So we're probably have people in this room who love board games and play every week, and people who haven't played a board game in 10 years because they're just not into them. So if they were to show up to a LARP, and it turns out that it was half a board game, or had uh, or they, they love being embodied in a LARP character, but they don't like narration. But it turned out that it was half narration because it was hybrid. Um, I think it's really important that we would project, that we telegraph that a lot. I'm curious uh, what ways we can telegraph that. And also, if that self-selection could maybe have a problem of narrowing our potential audience too much. If we make a game that has a CCG, a computer part a game, uh, a buffer, uh, a narration, and, and uh, an intense like spotlight, uh, is there and someone- exactly three players of Right, in the world, <laughs> who, who actually want to play all aspects of your game. The, 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 the triathlon, the triathlete game. Right, or the decathlon, yeah. We call it sausage ice cream. We mix all like different good things that are not necessarily good together. <laughs> <laughs> 
But there's a, a potential alternate model where it's you, you don't need someone who likes all of those things in like, these modular kinds of designs that, that some of the examples that we have, like you can get the CCG players to come in and maybe by just by being surrounded then by LARPers that they wouldn't want to interact with them, you, you get some, some of that crossroad adjacent to there too. That does work in mega games, for example, since everybody gets to pick which which um, role they'll have. So you can make it very clear if you're interested in doing like the war game, be a military person. And also in campaign large, like to still be rising, you can opt out of the things that you're not interested in. So the aspects of that game that you're you're just not going to enjoy, at least in theory, you can just say that's not for me. I'm not going to be a bopper fighter. That's not part of my experience. I want to roll that. Um, so I, I think that's, that might be a way forward for that for the sausage ice cream problem, is to, to make sure that if you love sausage, but you really hate ice cream, that you can just do the sausage, you know, or, or do 90% sausage. This is getting weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's more on Twitter, Casey. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of convention. If it doesn't get weird, you're doing something wrong. I don't, I think there's, there's a problem with that, uh, with the, the question is that, that Hybrid games are not necessarily are the that is hybrid games aren't necessarily hybrid, right? They're, they're all games are hybrid, um, you know, and, and what we're looking at is just it doesn't appeal to the existing um, pre-existing sets of players that we have. But certainly, what I see with uh, with Starship Valkyrie uh, um, and okay, that's the only, that's the only example off the that I'm thinking of. What are, uh, is that um, it appeals to a broader base than. Um, than a lot of the, the traditional LARPs, um, because you know people are like, cool. It's a it's a starship. That's well, that's a lot better than, than you know than either the, the there are a lot of people for whom it's a lot more interesting than either the the, the traditional the, either the fantasy LARPing or the theater style LARPing, um, because uh, they're well okay partly because of Star Trek uh, fandom, but uh, um, it's a you know it's an appealing genre, and, and all games have a mix of have a mix of elements, and it has the potential to reach um, players who are not who are not interested in any single um, in, in in any of the other ones because it's the, it's a different mix of uh, of elements um, that they appeal to more. And, and if you're recruiting new people, they don't know any better. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. We yeah. want to recruit new people. And directly to answer the issue. Um, being clear about what the heck is going on in your game a hundred times, like comes up over and over again, panel after panel. Make sure that the people who are playing can get a, a realistic estimate of what's going to happen before they get into it. Because if they're paying money or spending their time, you know, we don't want to, we want to be respectful. I just wanted to uh, kill the sausage ice cream in the traps because I'm an evil person. Also, I wish I could say this to myself 10 years ago, but that's not really happening. I mean, one thing, we sold out the conventional thorn flock we're doing with White Wolf in two hours, and that's definitely using both tabletop freeform stuff and, and using the classic LARP stuff at different times. And for a lot of people, that was a deciding factor. Yeah. Um, but I also think we should, we should get a little bit better at not locking ourselves down. And then I had a flashback to the first LARP I played in 93. And this was at a school, and you'd play LARP, and then there'd be like breaks for having tabletop sessions. Very good idea in theory. Except what happens with those who don't want to play tabletop and think it's a bit boring. And when everybody's teenagers, of course, they're going to raid the rooms of those playing tabletop and kill them. And then there's a huge discussion of did they kill their characters, which we thought we did. We, of course, didn't. Or did we just bust into a tabletop session and beat up some friends? <laughs> <laughs> and be huge assholes, which was, of course, more close to the actual truth. But then it was just an emergent design that maybe wasn't good for everyone, except for the war story. But I think if that had been planned, it would, I would have loved to be playing a tabletop game knowing that at any time the door could burst open and I had to grab my sword and become my, my different alter ego character. Forget about Call of Cthulhu and then fight the orcs invading. I mean, I would love to go to that now. Then it wasn't really... The, so I think more, more sausage ice cream, not less. Uh, I Class, you had a question earlier. Did it disappear, dissipate over time? No, no, it, it, uh, I just wanted to say yeah. something. I think the conclusion is that okay. sausage ice cream is delicious, actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was my yeah. question. Yes. Very, very interesting. I, I will go back to it from point. Uh, it feels like um, the, the question about mechanics from tabletop into work, we've got a, an obvious one that we use in both on um, resource mechanics. 
right? We have we have different resources that we often represent with my cards that we create or whatever, like it's on. Um, but uh, another one that seems to be very effective um, is uh, is the worker placement model, and mm -hmm. that's um, essentially taking a person in a large as a worker in a worker placement game and uh, trying to give them meaningful, uh, you know, active things to do, but taking that that idea that different people are doing, are investing their time in different areas at different times, seriously, uh, and, and uh, that that adds to a combined goal um, that, that you know, worker placement game, you're playing the person that takes advantage of that combined goal, but your, uh, your players are, are pawns, essentially. Are there other things like that that um, you're making you're me have a lot about? of ideas, Dave. <laughs> that, that's great. Um, yeah. I think the Mega Games is really going for that in some ways yeah. because you're, you're assigning people to certain roles. And I just want to say I love the heck out of that game. It had was it Watch the Skies? Uh, it was the sequel to Watch the Skies. Um, and but but I think it's a matter of it developing. So it was a really fun experience. People went and had a great time, but it's it's fine tuning that. Um, uh, and it's interesting, like the, the worker placement per se, like you're putting someone and you're saying do this for, you know, X number of time, and then, um, so you want to make sure who's the, the player empowerment there. Um, but Sandbox Parallel Life actually functions in that way too. It does. Where you have subsystems that people can reach out. Yeah, Mono Per Celeste was basically a worker placement game in that way. When you spend X amounts of time, five people on repairs, you will have a global effect from that. So it's like, where do you put your people at the time? Mm. And will the Halatha make sure that there's now no work done in this area, so that will deteriorate, and then other, do work in other areas instead? And the question is, what's the quality of the mini game? The, 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 yeah. the, the activity there then has yeah. to itself be of, of sufficient quality. So like, you know, if there's someone who's doing a hacking thing in your cyberpunk game, maybe have them write a program, whatever the player characters mm. Understanding of that program. Animals for an ecological restriction. Exactly. Right. Right. But but but, but those mini activities act, then become the soul of your game because there is no larger picture. And make sure that the pieces that are the gears are all engaged, so that everybody feels that they what they're doing actually matters on the broader scale and they can see it somehow. And yeah. Not having a intercom that worked in the entire ship killed that. That was like, you, if we would have had intercom messages, I, I know there are different opinions on this, but if we would have an intercom that says, now this is done, everybody knows that you get instant sense of agency, instant reward. Instead, it had only a phone system, so it's like hellish fog of lore yeah, at that, that game. Really, really bad. But it was like a simple technical thing. I was like, of course there's going to be an intercom. Nope, there wasn't. Yeah. We got around that by uh, having all of the GMs had Skype, a group Skype chat. So they all could check in with each other in real time and make announcements. But this was player facing information, yeah. was the problem. Well, Games were completely so coordinated. What, players I'm saying, were. what I'm saying is basically we also didn't have the intercom, so we improvised. So all the GMs had Skype and they would announce to the room. Matt, was, what was the, tell us about what that game was. This was my vampire game. Oh. Uh, we were actually playing in a, uh, a condemned hotel. So there was people in different rooms, different floors, and uh, we actually didn't have any technology because we weren't supposed to be there. Um, Were you uh, unofficially in this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we broke in and we broke in. <laughs> and uh, because we didn't, we didn't even have any lights, so we were using the lights and everything else. This is a very hard for me. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, so we basically uh, had a group Skype chat with all the GMs in the different Rooms, so they could actually check in with what's going on, and when we had big announcements, like the Justice Cards were coming, we would announce that, and um, everybody on the fourth floor suddenly died. So the, these events were, it wasn't as good as an intercom, but it was as close as we could get with the limitations that we had. Also, thanks for proving my idea that rave organizing and LARP organizing is quite similar. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like we're moving into the realm of the basic gaming. But but really game. Really on the intercom, I think, I think it's important to think about at least the fact that we, we want mirroring for our actions, but we don't want mirroring for everyone else's actions. Uh, the intercom can be overwhelming because you're hearing the intercom announcements about everybody's actions, uh, when really what we want is mirroring our actions. And maybe even a little bit of fog of war, fog of LARP, about everyone else's 
most of that too. So in the debrief, you can find out, oh, that was happening, that's kind of cool. But in the, in the play, you're not being distracted constantly by, if, if it is going to be a constant distraction. We, we tried sound not, effects, but it was too unclear. Yeah, yeah. They were not identified. Edwin Hutchins in Cognition in the Wild, this is none of the other games, social theorist, talks about navigation in uh, actual military vessels and how that, um, how they, they have open communication that gives mirroring of what each other is doing and mentoring into future, interestingly, mentoring into future practice. Um, but essentially, they're open lines that everyone who's navigating is on, but not everyone else. So it's task based open communication. Uh, Edwin Hutchins said that. Yes, that's I, I totally have a question. Um, I'm curious, what frontiers are you guys excited about? Thank you. That, that's, that's, and we have about five minutes left, and I think that's the perfect thing to end with, is uh, to expand on that. Give us, give us a little bit of a call to action. You talked about solved and unsolved problems earlier. Uh, and so to open up, what are the unsolved problems that a lot of designers out here, what are the interesting things that you think going forward that we can explore in that area? Um, I think uh, a, a VR and AR, virtual reality, alternate reality, it's really, really happening now. It's been a, a thing that's been, oh, this is going to be so great. Oh, okay, um, maybe it'll be so great. Um, but I feel like the technology is entering our lives in a much stronger, more robust, realistic, possibly um, feasible, like economically feasible way soon. Um, and that will be a real game changer. Uh, so, the further pollution of these various uh, pristine forms, uh, which I'm a big fan of, which is really what we're talking about, right? Finding, finding things that, that work well at one medium and applying them uh, sloppily to another. Uh, so that's, that's exciting to me. I'm really interested in games that, that make you feel good. That's something I'm starting to get interested in. Games that ultimately have some positivity to them or that uh, uh, with an with a end state where the, the express goal is to have an end state that uh, where all the characters are better off than they were when they started. Uh, I don't think we see that very often, and I'd love to see more of that. Uh, and how to, how to make that interesting and still redolent with bloody conflict. Um, so those are areas that I'm excited about. Um, also, uh, the, the, uh, the point of entry for people who are interested in performative play, finding ways to, uh, to make uh, make that, that uh, lower those barriers to entry and find really delightful ways to bring people in and allow them to experience the things that we know are joyful and are meaningful and exciting in maybe two minute chunks rather than two hour chunks or two day chunks. That's what I'm thinking about. Stole my answers. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the pollution forms, the, the, the positive, uh, Positive games. I'll, I'll be. I'll, I'll, I'll just um, try to get a, a little more specific about. Um, a lot of American games have have a have these sort of heavy. Uh, American LARPs have these sort of heavy mechanics uh, that are. I, I think everyone agrees. You know, feel kind of clunky, um, and uh, bringing in more. Well, maybe not everyone agrees. Um, <laughs> probably a lot. Uh, and. Uh, Bringing in some of the bringing some of these hybrids, especially from uh, from more of the indie game uh, indie RPGs uh, and from Euro games, uh, and to make those uh, to make it work uh, smoothly and seamlessly, and bringing so bringing in some of the more mechanical games more into line with the theater, so that they um, to in, which could have a broader audience than either potentially, um, and yeah, positive uh, um, positive games. Uh, okay, I'll, and and. Widening the, the culture of games, uh, so less uh, uh, less about the same you know uh, uh, less about the, the same you know fantasy or uh, um, or Star Trek or what have you, and uh, and start bringing in uh, in more cultures, um, which tabletop games have uh, at least are mildly better than than you know, not that tabletop games are particularly good, but. Uh, um, uh, there's there's potential for uh, for having uh, having more variety of sources and genres. Yeah, just want to build on that and just say more voices, writing, designing, making more accessibility for people to be able to engage in this as a creative activity. And, and uh, the, the talking about technology, technology uh, is very entry to and, and it's a uh, market privilege, right, which needs to be considered in the process.
So pollute the forms, make as wide a variety of people happy as we can. So they call 